And I have never been so excited since I talked to the princess from Never Ending Story. <laughs> and now here's my other favorite fantasy film. I love it so much. It's a great I love that movie. song. Giorgio Moroder is so great. Yeah. So our guest is standing by. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call in right away because we're calling in through a conference line. So I have to I have to figure out how to fiddle with the computer. Hopefully Edgar's on our side this time. We'll see. We have to rename his computer Edgar now. Uh, it, like I said, the last time we did that, it it, it, it didn't go well. But we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. And see if it doesn't, uh, you know. Will Welcome happen. and thank you for choosing freeconferencecall.com. You're helping people around the world commute. If you are the host, press star now. Otherwise, please wait and you will be joined into the conference. Please announce yourself. Tiffany Dufault. Hello. Hi. Hi, Lenny. Uh, how are you? I'm very well. Good evening, Good Tiffany. Evening. How are you? I'm well. Let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor who many remember from so many great films, Tender Mercies, Electric Dreams, and of course, as Harold Smith from Twin Peaks, the series and Firewalk with me. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Lenny Von Dolan. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you so much. I wanted to start out by letting you know, Terry, uh, the host, he's sitting to my left here. He has a little bit of laryngitis tonight, so hopefully he'll come through okay and you'll be able to hear him. Oh. But we're both very excited to be okay. talking with you. So. <laughs> you perhaps have been in three of the best movies ever made. And I want you to know, we watched Toll Booth last night. And you and Feruza uh, Balk oh. tremendous. So what is your memories of Toll Booth? I want to start out talking about it because I saw it last night. Yes, um, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think that movie is a a, a jewel. Yeah, it um, it was such a uh, interesting exploration. I I had some uh, pre production time, which is really a, a a sweet gift, and so I went down to Florida and I found the exact accent I wanted and for that place where we were going to be mm -hmm. and I uh, started changing things like my skin I got tan with a little help from the makeup lady but uh, uh, and my hair I wanted it to be like I've been in the sun all my life and because of that Floridian you know the keys it I was only there for a month before we started, but I knew yeah. this place makes you go round the bend <laughs> right. just a little bit. You yeah. got you got to be a little bit twisted, you know. And uh, so that was a great help. And then you know we had all these wonderful uh, other characters to play with, and and a lot of them uh, my dear friends. Um, and uh, we were in. Uh, Key Largo and Tavernier and uh, oh god all wow. kinds of hideaway places during hurricane season with mosquitoes as big as your fist oh I know I and, used to live in uh, Florida it's a bug haven <laughs> you know yeah so try playing a love scene you know <laughs> in, a, in, an old, in an old cab you know They've just been sprayed for mosquitoes, and then okay, you, you can get in now. And so you get in, and you do this love scene. And <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's kind of part of the job. But um, no, we had such a interesting time down there. It was, uh, I think, a unique experience for us all. And when we went to uh, Cannes with a movie, they loved it and uh, put us on the cover or the back, I should say, of the Hollywood Reporter. Wow. Well, that tickled our director and yeah. our producer. And, you had said and one time thought, wow. in an interview 
that you loved it because, and you think about it today, that they don't make movies like that anymore. In, in what way do you mean they don't make movies like that? I mean where mm, there's a confluence of talents and tastes that are kind of stirred together in a, in a happy way, and you have time. We had time. So the cast met here in Los Angeles uh, for a dinner, and, you know, there was a familiarity, even friendships. And so by the time we got to Florida and we're on set and we're in character, um, there was a depth of, of rich kind of the stuff that we had created just by being open and, and with each other and, and trusting and um, passionate about this, telling this crazy story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which it was, it is, a, it is an unusual tale. <laughs> what was it? What was it like working with? Uh, because it was very interesting in Tollbooth. Uh, he played two characters with Seymour Castle. He played one that was like the, uh, the nicest guy, and the other was obviously the deplorable father. Uh, uh, and we, he's wait, a veteran character out. actor. Are we right in knowing it was the same actor? He looked very similar, but I wasn't sure if it was the same guy. Oh, that was Seymour Castle. Yeah. yeah, Seymour played those two roles. Right, and um, Louise Fletcher was also meant to play two roles um and uh you know all kinds of things happen and cutting and final thing but she had such a great part uh as the mother of Feruza that um she didn't need that other part but what a showcase for Seymour to uh mm -hmm. you know strut his stuff and uh pick up all that roadkill, my God. Who should <laughs> ever forget that? It's kind of a unique situation because obviously you felt comfortable with her. Uh, maybe that helped, but you worked with Louise three different times. No, that was Ellen Bless Larkin. you for saying mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, I worked with Louise uh, four times. Oh. And in 1990, we met, uh, and it altered my life altogether for the better. Um she has become a, a dear friend and mentor and we met doing this movie in Virginia and uh, I was there for a month and I, it was the third movie I had carried and I was really serious about my job <laughs> <laughs> and so I had uh, one week I had the great Ned Beatty and he did all his scenes and vamoosed yeah. The next week, I had Robert Vaughn. Oh, we man. played together, and I killed him in the elevator. And he left. And then the final week, Miss Fletcher shows up. And I had met her earlier uh, here in Los Angeles before this movie, too. And, uh, in fact, I, <laughs> I, um, I just peb, peb, um, peppered her with questions about uh, what she thought about our characters and everything. And much later, she told me, she thought they stopped making them like me <laughs> because of my uh, that zeal, this crazy zeal to get it right, to 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 mop up all the truth as possible. And anyway, when she got there to Virginia to do her uh, part of the movie, her first job was just to look out a window. Several different days of her looking out the window at me coming home. She's my landlady in the movie. And so I thought, well, I'm going to be there for her off camera, you know. She didn't need me. She didn't <laughs> need anything. She's a master, a mistress. She's a skilled artist. And I've been running around doing this movie for a month and just, you know, whacked, just totally in it and beyond nervous wreck. And I asked her, Louise, how are you so calm, so so centered, just come in, you do that job, you do it, you don't even, you know. She said, Lenny, it's taken me 40 years yeah. to get this way. And I thought, oh, there's a chance. <laughs> I, can, I, I, I have a, you know, a, a, it's something to work toward. And she, um, uh, 
I find it so amusing that people all around the world know her as Nurse Ratchet, and I know her as one of the gentlest, sweetest, wittiest, loveliest, kindest human beings you'll ever know. I'm sure you would have got so, it on your own because you're a smart guy, but to come up in acting and you know, have all those mentors around you, incredible. I was very lucky, yeah, starting with Duvall and then Carl Malden and then Louise and um, and they were all generous and and kind of amused probably by this greenhorn who wanted to get it right. right. Now before, uh, we want to talk about Tender Mercies, but before that I wanted to talk about, uh, which I think was your first uh, thing on film. I, obviously, you had done stage work, but uh, and that was the the film Kent State. I mean, that was pretty lofty oh. subject matter for somebody who was doing their first film. That that whole subject, what happened, just angers me so much. I'm an old guy, and incredible what happened. I know you're not from Ohio, are you? No, I'm from uh, Illinois. No, no, I I'd never heard of. I mean, I was you know pretty young when it, in 1970 and pretty out, you know, of current events. And um, so it was an education for me to learn this and a political uh, rising from my guts came up, just like you. I felt this, yeah. what do you mean this happened in our country? And um, we uh, went down to Alabama. We, they shot down in Alabama. They found a school that would let them, that looked like Kent State that had the grassy knoll and everything, and um, and there was Ellen Barkin. And I'm, she and I had done a play together in New York, and so I knew her. and And we would do Tender Mercies later, but it was also a fa a, a real collegiate feel of all these New York actors, save one Los Angeles actor, Michael Horton, and we uh, all bonded together, except. The National Guard stuck with the National Guard, the actors playing them, and uh, and all the, the students and the hippies stayed, you know. <laughs> and uh, that's not that's <laughs> weird. <-pollinate. laughs> I'm actually, yeah. I've seen that on sets, that's and I'm like, really? <laughs> I think when you're young, Terry and Tiffany, you you tend to do anything that, you know, I mean, maybe try too hard, yeah. um, but um, it's it's the desire, or the yearning to get it right. You know, and that's all it is. Well, I hope they paid and you whatever it takes. Right. I hope they paid you well. I know it was an independent film, but I would have done uh, Toll Booth for free, only because I would get to kiss <laughs> Perusa Bulk. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! Well. Yes. Um, at one point, I was on board pretty early on, and they were talking to me about my co-star maybe being Drew Barrymore, and my jaw dropped and said, <laughs> no, I can't make love to the little girl from E.T. I can't do it. I mean, uh, uh, anyway, that, you know, of course, she's a grown-up now, and but at the time, it seemed impossible and then Feruza came on board and she was perfect and um, yes Feruza one of a kind now I, and, I've got an um, idea in my head I know you're a little shy but I, I gotta really believe that she was shyer than you am I right in interpreting that she's a little shy in a way yes I think so I think she is Terry um, and she's very um gifted um uh, artist she uh, I, I i caught her sort of doodling and it wasn't it wasn't just doodling it was really quite beautiful mm. and so she has a really um wonderful inner life i think well i hope she's I doing well i don't i haven't seen her lately mm. and, but uh i'm glad you enjoyed her because i did too mm. well i was always going to get myself because she used to have uh, a store that was a spiritual kind of uh, cult arts or witchcraft kind of a, a store. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man, that's right. pipes. Yeah. yeah. I always was going to go there and meet her, but yeah. I never got a chance to. She sold the store, and we had the owners of the store on the show, but I would love to get her on sometime. She just kind of disappeared, you know? 
Well, if I see her, I'll send her your way. Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay. It'd be great. Now, I know that <clears throat> by the time you got to Tender Mercies that you had worked with Ellen Barkin three times. Uh, I, I read an a interesting fact about the very first time that you worked with Ellen. It was in, a, like, a two-act play, right? <laughs> Where in the world did you find me? <laughs> yes, that's so... So, you know what the name of that play was? Uh, yeah, I believe it was Bless uh, Me, Father, For I Have Sinned. So I have to know about this. Dead. You're dead right. <laughs> And that was the first thing I did in New York City. And I played a 13-year-old who masturbated on a radiator <laughs> and listened to the radio. And Ellen Barkin was my teenage girlfriend in the play, you know. And, uh, oh, that was a great cast. Judith Ivey and Elizabeth Franz and Dick LaTessa, all these theater, you know, heavyweights. And, uh, and it was funny and it was an Irish... Uh, playwright who was telling <laughs> I think his own story uh -huh. and yeah that's that's where Ellen and I first met and then the next time I saw her it was in Waxahachie Texas and she was speaking uh, or listening with a headset to someone who was Texan so she could get that accent right Ellen Barkin from Brooklyn was in Waxahachie and boy was I surprised to see her and she did a great job and uh she gave me her her uh, barbells. Uh, she lifted weights at the time, and, yeah. and uh, I guess she didn't need them anymore, and I took them, and I love that experience because it was, you know, your first, and you never forget it, and my first scene and my first movie was with Robert Duvall, and I thought, I do not want to be, I'm not a morning person, mm -hmm. so I did not want to be sleepy for this event oh. so i would wake up two hours before my call time and run around the motel in waxahachie and then press my face into the ice machine and get awake you know so i could be wide awake and full on for that and then of course we get there to the set and it's maybe six seven eight hours before you actually do the scene and but all these things you don't know mm -hmm. when you start out you you have to learn, and uh, but I was awake. <laughs> I was good and awake. Well, in, in good taste, I won't ask you about the radiator if you practiced a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at this point, I mean, it was a comedy. Yeah, oh, there you go. That means it's okay. <laughs> at this point, uh, when you when you were doing Tender Mercies, how what did your family think? I mean. Uh, you didn't have any other actors that I know of in your family. Um, I believe that your family no. was into, they had their own business and things like that. Uh, so what did they think about their their little boy going on to be an actor and then getting to work with Robert Duvall? Oh, Tiffany, that's such a sweet memory because um, they lived about five hours from Waxahachie, Texas, and they drove there um bruce bearsford had invited they said you know have your parents come and so they came and um visited the set and it was the day that i had this big scene with duvall just he and i and uh um and bruce bearsford was so courtly and uh, open and welcoming to them and um so they got to watch this and uh and I don't know what they thought, but they were very sweet. And um, I remember they took us, they took Tess Harper and uh, I think just Tess and myself out to dinner that night. And, uh, and uh, the <laughs> Tess said something funny when the dessert came round and they offered uh, uh, triple layered chocolate cake and she said oh no honey I might as well just take that to my thighs now <laughs> and, uh, uh, I never forgot that she was so funny and um, so my parents I think just sort of you know do what supportive parents do they love me and um, uh, encourage me and uh, made sure it made the paper and the Goliath 
you know, <laughs> uh, our little hometown newspaper, and uh, it's a, a sweet little Norman Rockwell kind of town in South Texas. It's got a courthouse square, and um, my grandfather had the third oldest drugstore in Texas, wow. and uh, that building still stands. And uh, there's also a hanging tree where my great great grandmother was said to have seen as many as six or seven men hanging wow. cattle rustlers you know yeah so it has that history you know it's got a kind of there's a mission there as well that's comparable to the alamo even better i think uh, and it's uh there was a famous battle there and uh so it's a it's a very very special town i uh you know I haven't lived in a red state since 1977, and I I won't. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I saw you're a Democrat. Uh, I'm, I'm, I just want to say good choice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it's not a choice. It's a uh, um, it's just a passion. Yeah. It's, you know, it's I uh, I I just I don't know how we lived for those four years, and we're. And then we had the pandemic. I think we're incredible. Yeah. But we're still standing. Yeah. How about that? Absolutely. Um, and you know who else yeah, is incredible? I have to give us all. We want to give uh, one of your co-stars credit, who was part of uh, winning the Oscar for her movie of the year. I think it was movie of the year. And that is Marley Matlin. And you worked with her in Pretty uh, Fences. <gasps> oh, my goodness, yes. I was so happy. That was the... That was the best thing about the whole night for me. I didn't watch it in real time, but I read about it. And, oh, 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 well, let's not go there. <laughs> but she uh, she uh, deserved that. And we had, uh, I was so happy for her. And Jack, her interpreter, who was kind enough to teach me the signing that I had to do when we, when Marley and I played brother and sister in a, episode of Picket Fences, and that's how we met, and um, and so Jack taught me all, all these signs, and oh my gosh, that was a whole world uh, that I was so privileged to be a part of, and uh, she said, uh, she said uh, so many things, um, but um, she, she uh, is this pure light, and uh, and that movie uh, is closer in feel to what we were talking about at the beginning, Terry, mm -hmm. about um, like Tender Mercies and uh, Toll Booth, these movies that are about people and relationships yes. and stories that follow that. And, and, you know, there's still some of us who like those kind of things. And uh, so Coda, you know, I think it was a little bigger budget than Toll Booth and yeah. Tender Mercies. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but still, you know, it, it's, it's not a Marvel movie. And yeah. uh, God bless it for, mm -hmm. for, for, you know, getting seen and, and, and introducing, you know, a whole other pool of talent to the world. Well, you know, um, uh, you're great in everything you do. Uh, you even tried sci-fi. You was in an episode of The Oroville. But I'm telling you, man, where your forte is, <laughs> is showing emotion. You have the greatest depth of oh. emotion of any actor I've ever seen. Oh, my and, gosh. And well. you, you make me cry. That's hard to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I have to. And, and talking, talking about uh, depth of emotion and also talking about uh, real character-driven pieces, this is the perfect opportunity to start talking about Twin Peaks. Uh, Harold Smith operates on so many different levels as a character. Uh, tell me about how you got Twin Peaks, uh, how the audition was. Uh, did you have any any clue about the show at all before you went in to read for it? No, and what a dummy I was. I mean, what rock was I living under? But I had not seen the, the series yet, and so when... Um, I got the part, they sent up all the tapes of the shows that had been done so far, you know, that tells you 
how long ago it was. They were v VHS tapes. <laughs> and uh, I watched them all, and wow, my head exploded. Right. I thought, this is not television as I knew it. And uh, I was very eager to jump in <laughs> after that. And then, of course, I got to work with uh, not only Mr. Lynch, but all these different directors, uh, Leslie Gladder and uh, Leslie Lincoln Gladder, I should say, and uh, uh, Tom Holland and was wonderful directors and, uh, uh, and, 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 and to explore that, that thing of uh, being isolated and, and afraid of going out. And I used to joke that anybody who contemplated getting on the Hollywood freeway would be an agoraphobic. <laughs> uh, but yes. I, uh, I, I, you know, I, I did have to go into a deep dive about what that's like. You know, that's not something I ever knew about. And I talked to people who, who, who have this issue, and they were very open with me and that was so helpful and uh god bless him yeah. god bless him well you were exactly i want to find easy. out yeah uh we had on just before you michael horse who's uh chief deputy hawk uh, who's the one that found you yeah. dead uh he actually found your body hanging uh he said that he was <laughs> only concerned about twin Peaks and the fact that uh cbs was scared to death of that show because of the topic of I incest, yeah, incest and everything that went on with, with the wonderful Shirley, we'll talk about her because I know you're close friends. But did you were you concerned about? That? I mean, were you worried that you know here, this so approaching a subject they never approached? David on TV. definitely pushed limits. David and Mark Frost definitely pushed boundaries. Without a doubt, um, they created a whole new landscape of a dreamscape I should say and it's a it's what visionaries do right. and they were miracle of miracles able to transport to translate that to the screen you know you can write all kinds of wild and innovative things but they don't always translate and that was a miracle because it went right from the page to the screen to the people's hearts, and it was, uh, that's been interesting to find this really uh, advanced in their thinking, in my experience, uh, these Twin Peaks fans and aficionados. I think they're, I've met them all over the globe, and they uh, always amaze me. They know far more about it all than me. Uh, but uh, they're so bright, and they're and they have a you know that aesthetic is uh, it sings to them, you know, and it sounds like maybe it sings to you guys too. Yeah. Absolutely, it's uh, it's a special thing. And uh, it the other day I was driving home, and um, it was early in the morning. And David came on the radio. And <laughs> said, Do, doing the weather. The, 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 yeah. And, <laughs> and then he played this great song. And I thought, my God. Do I have another reason to be glad I live here? <laughs> yeah, that's one. And, uh, uh, I mean, because it was such a surprise. I, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know he was doing that. Yeah. Now I know he does it every yeah. day, and I, I try to listen to it when I can. One time, it's not the last time I saw him, because I saw him at the, uh, we were all at the uh, Missing Pieces uh, screening right. uh, that he did. And, uh, yeah, and, um, and, but the time before that I saw him, we were both at a red light on Franklin. <laughs> and, <laughs> He he! I turned and looked, and I saw that hair. You know, is that David? And he turned and saw me. And then before we could even open our mouths, the light the light turned green, and you know we had to go. Right. So what what do you do? It's Los Angeles. You know he has uh, but, Texas roots as well, and maybe it was because of that. But I am 
very uh, you you had you know I'm proud of you and I don't know how you did I wouldn't have had the balls to do it to where you actually suggested to David that a few of your scenes go differently such as your death as such as other things situation with the hole the garden hole the um, towel uh, yeah. the towel approaching the girls and your uh, death you wanted it differently how did that go with talking to yeah. David oh well. <laughs> The moral to that story is don't have any great ideas at the last minute. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the reason is because, uh, I don't know, um, it just occurred to me, by that time I was so sick into the density of that world, you know, and uh, so I was kind of channeling whatever that was of him and so when that came up it just didn't seem right and I thought why doesn't it seem right and and then it occurred to me that he would take the one um, solace and comfort that never left him he'd take it with him and he'd take all the, the orchids and that if if they could all just go together with some carbon monoxide seeping in and that gorgeous music by Angelo, well, that could be pretty. Yeah. Um, and more in keeping with his spirit. But David said, we built the raptor, we're going to hang you. <laughs> so they hung it. Oh, man. Well, was that you or was that a dummy? I can't tell that to you right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, if well, it was you, you did a good job. I didn't see you move. <laughs> in the series, uh, oh, in, the, in the series, uh, most of your scenes were with Laura Flynn Boyle, um, but you did work a little bit mm -hmm. with uh, Cheryl Lee as not as Laura, but as a different character. But in Firewalk with Me, right. I, I want to talk about your scene with Cheryl Lee as Laura in that um, because it was a very in depth and very emotional I, I think it's interesting uh, that I, in my opinion I think the pairing of David Lynch directing along with you who really cares about the character and the depth of the character was a perfect match because there seems to be so much more than what's on the surface so uh, tell us a little bit about the scene that you did with Cheryl in Firewalk with me and, and what it was like filming that it, was, it seemed very intense Indeed, it was, um, and um, I remember that day so well because, you know, it was one scene and I got there, as is my habit since Tender Mercy, very early, and so walking down the hall, who do I run into in a red fright wig, but none other than the great David Bowie, oh, God. and I just thought, my God this is the way this day is going to start <laughs> and uh what happened was you know this happens a lot in tv and movies that get behind and so we didn't get to that scene till very very late at night i mean after midnight and uh the crew was you know amazing but they just had been going non-stop and miss lee and i were on simmer for about you know seven or eight hours holding all this stuff <laughs> and checking in on each other now and then and finally we got to set and i hear david uh shout across the hall to this dp deepak never schedule the most important scene in the movie for three in the morning <laughs> and that you know th that that of course, was a sweet way for him to get us up for this job, right. and uh, and uh, it got everybody uh, focused. and uh, And God, what a pleasure, you know, to go out on a high wire and know that you're safe. You can do a triple spin, whatever, and. It's just fine if you fall flat on your face because you're in a safe environment and yeah. you don't get to work that way very much. And I loved it. And at the end of that, we were both 
pretty spent, as you might imagine. And uh, out of the corner of my eye, I told this story before, I saw this movement and it, I looked and it was David doing a kind of tall leprechaun version of a jig. <laughs> and um, he was sort of separate, you know, celebrating what had happened. The whole day was finally over. and But it also seemed like he was saying, this just happened. Let's do a little dance about it. And I thought, oh, man, that's what it's about. Right. Yeah. I understand you're still friends with Cheryl Lee. Is that right? Oh, yes. For life. There you go. Well, I would be remiss if we did not talk, if, if I forgot to talk about this in the interview. Uh, before I saw Twin Peaks, uh, Terry and I are father and daughter. And before I ever saw Twin Peaks, oh. uh, I was actually introduced to you when I was very young uh, with a, a movie from 1984 called Electric Dreams. And I absolutely <laughs> adore that film. So. It is our, together, oh. it's something we bond on uh, as father and daughter, because of course we're in the whole computer thing, even with the radio station. But my God, that was like the greatest fantasy film ever made. Uh, that and, and Never Ending Story are my two favorites, and it is right there at, at number one with Edgar and the voice of the great Bud Court. Oh. And, of course, you're loving the movie. My daughter oh. got to meet her. I'm so jealous. I got to work with Virginia Madsen. She's a very sweet woman. Did you? Oh, yeah. So good. tell us a well, little bit of, about Electric Dreams, because that was right after Tender Mercies, right? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty soon after that. Um, um, in fact, Rusty Lemoran, who wrote um, and produced Electric Dreams saw me in Tender Mercies, and, you know, there I was playing a good old boy, and, uh, but he thought maybe I could play this architect in San Francisco, and, um, and I thought, right on, and, uh, we met, and, uh, we met at the Russian Tea Room, and I, it was my first time there, and a friend told me to order the blinis, um, uh, with caviar, and I thought, really? Okay, so I did, and, uh, um, you know, we chatted, and uh, uh, the next thing I knew, we were in San Francisco, and uh, we were doing all the exteriors, and, and doing the end of the movie first, and uh, that was a big uh, learning curve, and... Uh, and it was an amazing crew, all British, um, the top of the top um, uh, people. And they uh, really shepherded me and Virginia through this, you know, our first starring roles and making us feel uh, protected and looked after. And, oh, my God, the tea breaks at 4 o'clock, <laughs> like clockwork. And, uh, and they were just so kind. And uh, and also very excellent to what they do. So it was. Uh, I say it's like uh, going off to um, uh, what do they call that? Uh, outward bound, yeah. and it kind of bonds you, you know. So Virginia and I went through this big experience together. We flew from San Francisco to London on Virgin Airways mm -hmm. in the upper deck of the first class, whatever, and they were playing. They were already playing the music, All the music. that was going to be in the movie. So great music. And that was great. creepy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if, I've got to get talking my... about flying on Virgin, what a lot of people uh, might not know is that Electric Dreams was actually executive produced by Richard Branson, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so Richard came to uh, set and uh, invited us, I remember, to a party on a barge that he had a house on this day. And like the stupid dunce that I was, uh, I wouldn't do this again. I chose to go home and because I had an early call that morning. Uh, you know how I like to get there early. Right. And uh, so I didn't go to this party, and I've been kicking myself since, what was it, Tiffany? Uh, 1984. Right. I've been kicking myself. <laughs> Right, right. Hey, they but I didn't go to that damn bar. 
if, if they ever put any movie in a time capsule to show people what the A's were like, <laughs> it's that movie. But at the same time, <laughs> that movie. there was a lot of things that were fantastical in that movie that is now kind of reality. Yeah. Like computers running our household right. and, and everything. I mean, now our lights do work on the computer. You You're know? not worried, Lenny, that your computer's going to start talking to you, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's kind of you know, dangerous. I my daughter... Go ahead. Sorry? Go ahead. No, I, my, you know, my kid is, uh, you know, was born in 2000. And so they're a technological native. I'm a technological immigrant. <laughs> um, and so that, that hasn't really changed since 1984. <laughs> well, I've got to get a uh, one sheet and then my, cell will be, my set will be complete because I already have an entire set of Electric Dreams lobby cards. So I cherish those. I really do. Oh, bless you. I understand. You know, I love the... Uh... Go ahead. I was just going to say I love the artwork in uh, the uh, yes. UK for the film. And uh, but what were you going to say? I was, I was going to say that movie's hard to find because they don't show it on, on cable or anything a lot. I have a company, VHS, but I don't think it was even released on DVD yet. I'm not sure. Hard to find, and so is the toll booth. It's really hard to find. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard rumors that it might end up on Amazon, but I don't know about that. In Electric Dreams, that's a whole MGM, um, you know, from the uh, uh, former empire of, you know, before it was, let's say, foreign-owned. <laughs> the, the MGM had all the rights to all this thing. Yeah. I don't really understand it, but it had something to do with that as to why, you know, it just came out on Criterion because um, Virginia and I did those interviews for that, but right. that's for the Blu-ray, I believe. Well, um, I tell you, if they ever, so, uh, some moron ever decides to remake it, I'm going to wind up like Harold in Twin Peaks. <laughs> There's no way they can remake that movie. <laughs> It really was a, a slice of, of time. And, and I guess to come to an end on this, I wanted to ask you, talking about Electric Dreams, you kind of worked with a computer again because you did a new short with an evil computer. Well, creator. You play Dr. Richard Cooper, right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes, you're very informed. This is something that's uh, coming soon. Uh, it's in a bunch of film festivals. It's a... Uh, a, a young visionary got called Andre LeBlanc, and um, he's uh, written this amazing story. Um, uh, <laughs> too true to be funny, really, um, about an AI that uh, goes rogue and uh, starts creating its own content. And uh, you know, like these people that they say Facebook has people. Um, filtering through all the, the violent right. and right. terrible things that we shouldn't see. So that's what this short film is exploring, that whole idea. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, that I, <laughs> it occurred to me, Jerry, when I was there, sitting in front of that screen, like, something's familiar here. <laughs> Who, whoever casted uh, you was so smart. That was ingenious casting. <laughs> Well, and then, and then uh, yeah. before we go, I wanted to ask, there was one other thing that I saw on, on IMDb, I don't know if it's true or not, that says it's in production, um, and you can tell us oh. if you're a part of that. That's Sally Wood with Sally Kirkland? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's being edited right now. It's in the final stages. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, it's a true story and uh, about a young man who comes from Maine, and uh, get, gets a job in Hollywood as Sally Kirkland's personal assistant. And uh, Jennifer Tilly and I play this young man's parents back in Maine. And uh, it's pretty funny because uh, there's Sally playing herself and, you know, no one like her. And uh, I uh, asked Zach, uh, who wrote the story if uh, 
I was playing his father basically, and he, I, uh, I asked if I, if I could wear something of his father's, and he he was very kind, and he let me, and uh, and we made a really interesting movie. I think I I, I look forward to seeing it. It was really uh, a lot of fun to do. That would probably be her last film. And uh, we were shooting it up in uh, Topanga Canyon during a fire. Mm. Mm. And uh, do we stay or do we go? You know that song? Right. It was like, and nobody wanted, you know, to wrap the movie because it's a movie and, you know, and but there's a fire. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we, we lived through it and we kept going. The show must go on. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that Sally would that that should be fun. And uh, you you all are so much fun to talk to. Well, I'm not going to <clears throat> ask um, you about it because I know you probably don't want to comment on it. Excuse my voice. Uh, but we we usually watch a movie after an interview, and uh, we try to pick one that, that we think is going to be okay. But we're going to watch one that I know you don't like tonight. <laughs> We're going to watch, and I didn't want to ask you in the uh -oh. interview, but we're going to watch Dracula's Widow. <laughs> Should we, or shouldn't um, we? Uh, this, this is me filtering all the bad words <laughs> out of my response right now. <laughs> good enough, good enough. May I, may I suggest uh, another? Yes. Uh, uh, okay, I'm not in it but I just saw it last night again for the first time in a long time. Have you seen Hester Street? No. With no. Carol Kane? No. It was made in 1975, and Carol Kane was nominated for an Academy Award the same year that Louise Fletcher won. And I just saw it for the first time. It's glorious in black and white, and it was directed by Joan Mitlin Silver, who I got to work with. Um, I did a little movie with her after... Hester Street, but Hester Street is well worth your time. All right, we'll check that out. Uh, Carol Kane's lovely. Yeah, yeah, uh, we got to see her in person and, yeah. and all that. She's great. Yeah, yeah. So well, is uh, but so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Lenny, uh, I want to thank so you. There I was. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm just steering you away from one movie and to another. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to let you know. That, in case you don't already know, you have throngs of hardcore fans out there. When we announced that you were going to be on the show tonight, I, I heard from so many of your fans that were so excited, including uh, one uh, oh. one person on Facebook whose screen name is, is River Road. I don't know if that's their you know real name, if their real name is River or not. But they had contacted me and had said that you were their number one favorite actor ever. Um, and there are so many Twin, Pe Twin Peaks fans out there, Electric Dreams fans out there. Um, so I just want you to know that you were very loved. Your art form is very much appreciated. We've even got. And I hope uh, to continue see you, seeing you work on the screen for many years to come. Yeah. We've even got uh, radio hosts from other stations that are not doing their work tonight, but listening to you. <laughs> oh, bless you both. That's so. That's so nice. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot all about all my problems, and I thank you uh, for for taking me down such a happy trail. Absolutely. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight, and uh, happy early Easter, although it's like, what, a couple weeks off? But uh, again, thank you for joining us tonight, Lenny. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you both. God all bless. Right. Stay right. well. Bye-bye.